Welcome to session five of uh, workshops on the writing of scientific texts. Uh, this is a session in which I'm going to set out the generic pattern of an article or a chapter in, an Anglo in the Anglo-American uh, tradition. Now, this is a challenging material to teach in a lecture format because it really needs to be uh, material that you come to understand by reading various texts and reflecting on how those texts are similar to or differ from the generic pattern I'm going to set out for you today. Now, I do hope that uh, having listened to this lecture, you will then go back and revisit some of the scientific literature uh, written in English, which you have used or plan to use in the course of the writing of your PhD. So this is an outline uh, and the following slides throughout the rest of this lecture are going to investigate in greater detail each of these four main elements here. So the introduction, uh, which in a way is the most complex piece of writing in any article in the uh, uh, Anglo-American tradition. Uh, number two, uh, a data section, which uh, keep in mind will or will not be present in your chapter or article based on the amount of data that you're uh, using uh, in your piece of writing. Really data heavy social sciences such as uh, demography, certain kinds of uh, sociology or psychology, certainly economics, uh, these uh, very often will have a separate section on data and data collection, uh, whereas example, uh, for example, articles in the field of literature, literary studies, and often in the, the fine arts for art history will not have a data uh, section. So keep in mind that number two here is optional, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, number three is the argument. And again, this is a, a really systematic, uh, systematic section of an article, a chapter in the Anglo-American tradition. Keep in mind the analogy of the ladder that I used in lecture one, where each step has to take place before the one after it. So you're moving up and up and up, and you can't skip a step. Your argument has to be built really systematically. I mean, in a way, this is the, the kind of beauty uh, or if you're feeling a bit more cynical, the, the kind of boring element of academic writing in the Anglo-American tradition that it's so systematic, that it's, it is just up a ladder. Lastly, I'll, I'll talk to you about the conclusion and uh, the elements that an examiner or indeed a uh, editor of an academic journal would expect to see in your typical uh, article or thesis chapter conclusion. Now, in a bit more detail here, I've divided the elements of the introduction <coughs> up across two slides. Now, as I said a, a second ago, the, the introduction, in a way, is the most complicated part of the article to structure. It needs to begin with a, either a proposition or a thesis statement, and I'll distinguish between these now. A proposition uh, is a kind of statement of, of what we wish to know, what we need to know. And it's given with the presumption that you will uh, provide this information in the course of the article or chapter. Now, a proposition is much more common in British academic writing than American. For example, uh, I've given you a, a proposition statement here with which an article might begin we need to understand more about 15th century farm economies. You're going to say that right at the beginning. <laughs> Do not start an article in the Anglo-American tradition by ruminating about various kinds of evidence or things historians have written in the past. Jump right in. Uh, and in the British tradition, you'll jump right in with a, a proposition like this. We need to understand more about X. In the American tradition, uh, students are increasingly told, don't just use a proposition, 
instead use a thesis statement, positively state your conclusion, uh, really as the first sentence of the article. So I, I give an example here. 15th century farms failed because farmers were risk averse. So that is even more blunt, even more sort of in your face, as we would say. Uh, so the use of, of a proposition is more British and the use of a thesis statement is more American. But both have the same function. They indicate very clearly in the first sentence or two sentences of a chapter or article what it's all about. Also, increasingly, uh, academics are instructed in the social sciences that the title uh, of the chapter or article should be absolutely direct, uh, something almost akin to a, a proposition or thesis statement. Uh, long gone are the days when academics used to, 20 or 30 years ago, choose an uh, elegant article title which said something about the theme of the article rather than the specific argument made. Now, uh, PhD students and young academics are told article titles need to be absolutely direct, even if they're inelegant. And in this way, social sciences are moving closer to the so-called hard sciences like physics or mathematics. Say. The second element of your introduction uh, will be a literature review. Now, keep the literature review specific to your study. If you're an historian, this literature review will comprise uh, historiography. So this is a, uh, that word, of course, historiography means the, the kind of history of writing this kind of history. If you're in a, a different social science, uh, something like sociology, for example, uh, it will be a, a more of a, of a indication of each of the main ways in which we have thought about the topic in the past uh, with less specific reference to uh, past scientists than you would get in, in history, say. Now, your, your literature review, not only does it need to be relevant, specific to your study, but it needs to indicate who first examined this topic, and then you're going to move through the key advances in knowledge in this area. And you're going to, ideally, if you're trying to get an article accepted into a journal, you would do well to highlight the role of other articles in that same journal in advancing the topic. A literature review can never be exhaustive. It can never include everything written on that subject in the past not unless you're in a very, very obscure field indeed. So you really just need to focus on uh, who first looked at it, key advances in knowledge, and lastly, the present debate. Uh, if people are writing on it just at this moment and you're joining in that debate, or if people haven't looked at this lately, the reason we need to renew the study of this topic. And that third element in the literature review it is really crucial uh, to getting your article accepted or, your, or for your chapter to be passed as part of a PhD. Because I think very often uh, PhD students think that because they're bringing new knowledge, uh, new knowledge to the discipline, that that itself is a justification for doing the research. But again, that is no longer felt to be the case. And this is very much part of the influence of the hard sciences on the social sciences that we now need to justify why this matters. Maybe not to the public in general, but within the context of this specific topic. Why do we need to renew study of this topic? If you look at your typical article in the Anglo-American tradition, you will see that footnotes and endnotes to secondary sources will typically be most numerous in the introduction. And uh, there's a very kind of systematic sort of contrast between the footnotes on the, the first few pages of an article, which are just full of references to other articles and books, and the, the argument section 
of a uh, chapter or article where the footnotes tend to be a small number of key pieces of literature and a large number of primary source references. Now, now that can be references either to uh, data in tab that's presented within the article in tabular form or as an appendix or to specific primary sources such as books or, uh, excuse me, such as uh, documents in an archive, original pieces of artwork, uh, or uh, surveys or studies undertaken uh, with the public, public or test groups. The latter three parts of a good introduction will include an overview of your methodology. Uh, this will indicate past methodology, and this is intertwined to a certain extent to the literature review. Uh, you now can mention, you go back to and mention the first person to look into the topic, as well as those who have played a role in shaping and changing the debate since then, and indicate how they approached it. Are you bringing a new methodology to the topic? You also need to indicate both your theoretical analytical tools on the one hand and your practical methodology on the other hand. Keep in mind that a, a reviewer of an article for a journal will normally look for both of these in the social sciences and they are distinct different things. Your theoretical analytical tools involve, for example, kinds of social theory like closure theory or social identity theory. Uh, whereas your practical methodolo methodology is more about how did you go about your sampling, uh, how did you go about collecting the evidence, and this isn't to say, oh, I went to an archive, but rather, as I sat surrounded by thousands of possible items, these are the ones I selected for study, and this, this is how I selected them. Maybe you looked at documents from every 10th year. Maybe you, uh, if you're in a different kind of social science, maybe you had test subjects come in for a, uh, a psychology study and you asked groups of 10 from different age groups uh, the same questions. So how, how did you do your sampling? Uh, what kind of quantitative analysis have you used? Have you used uh, only kind of natural data and basic quantitative analysis, or have you used metadata and complex quantitative analysis? You need to make it clear that you had this uh, methodology uh, set in your own mind before you started the research. Another uh, tool, for example, here, practical methodology, if you were a literature student, might be intertextual analysis. So you've gone through a, a body of ecclesiastical literature from the late Middle Ages, and you have systematically pulled out where passages in those books were copied from uh, Roman texts, uh, were copied from biblical, uh, biblical writings, uh, or copied from the Bible and so forth, intertextual analysis. So th there is a, a, a clear difference here between your theoretical analytical tools, such as the, you know, the theories basically, and your practical methodology, and you should indicate them both. The next element of your introduction will be where you, you then detail uh, your primary sources and data. Now, if you have a very data heavy article, you're going to just introduce your sources and data here and then come back with a fuller analysis in the following data section. But if you're dealing with a, uh, a uh, topic where your sources are mostly uh, other forms of theory and literature, then you can probably deal with your sources and data just in the introduction. The main questions to answer in the introduction whether you have that secondary data section or not, are what uh, sources and data, where did you find those sources and data, what's the scope of those sources and data, what do they tell you and what do they not tell you, uh, why did you choose this particular 
body of sources and data as opposed to others which may or may not have been available to you. Lastly, what are these, the specific advantages and disadvantages of the sources and data you've used? And this is something very concrete that uh, reviewers for academic journals will often ask. Why did you choose this specific set of data? You could have used others. And you, they really want to see stated clearly the advantages you felt accrued to you by using these sources and also to note their limitations. If you don't note the limitations, that's the first thing that a uh, reviewer for an academic journal will stop you on and ask for more detail on. Lastly, introduction in the Anglo-American tradition must include very clear advanced organizers. Now, advanced organizers are those statements, usually a, a paragraph in which you preview the shape of the article to come. You say, for example, this article will comprise, uh, and then you indicate the number of sections, maybe three sections, and you justify those three sections. What is the topic of section one, section two, and section three? Why have you included them in this order? Now you can achieve that with maybe only two sentences regarding each section. It doesn't have to be in great detail, but it needs to be there. This again is, is an instance where in the Anglo-American tradition, social sciences have become more like the uh, so-called STEM hard sciences. You must have a roadmap at the end of your introduction, making it absolutely clear what the reader can expect to see and the order in which the reader will see it. Conclude your introduction with a sentence indicating uh, how those sections will lead you to the conclusion and again highlight what that conclusion will be. Now, a data section is only going to exist uh, as a discrete part of your chapter or uh, article for heavily data-driven articles. In heavily data-driven articles, it's normal for the first section after the introduction to set out in detail the sources, the data collection methods, analytical tools, uh, especially for uh, econometric tools, as, uh, as we discussed in the previous lecture on quantitative methods. You will present an initial table if you have a heavy uh, uh, amount of data in your article. You will present an initial table which summarizes the data sources and content. Uh, you will then probably in a data heavy article have detailed tables addressing narrower aspects of the data, subsets of the data, in the appropriate sections to follow. Now, I can't stress enough here that uh, uh, you need to be transparent about your data in a very data-heavy uh, article. For example, imagine if you were interested in the kind of sociology of economics and you had uh, conducted surveys in which you'd asked groups of economists, uh, you'd ask groups of economists certain questions that reveal how they understand the economy, then you really need in this section to indicate what your survey questions were. Uh, again, uh, if you're taking econometric methods into account, if you're going to be in, engaging in kind of mathematical regression analysis, you need to indicate that here. Now the argument, what is sometimes called the main body of the article or chapter, again should be arranged in sections in the same order as indicated in the introduction. And note that I say here a hierarchical order because normally the first section ought to be the most contextual, excuse me, the most contextual and it needs to be really the bottom rung of the ladder. Uh, the very last section in the body of your argument needs to be the most specific and ideally the most convincing. It needs to be the, the kind of ultimate proof that your, art, that your argument is correct. Uh, 
the first is the foundation, the last section is the top of the ladder. And you would be amazed how uh, frequently even uh, British or American trained academics don't think about this and they rush to present the kind of final narrowest argument first and then try to back it up with more contextual sections. And the first thing that a reviewer will say for an academic journal or indeed a PhD examiner is rearrange this, put the broadest uh, argument uh, first and then move towards your more sp uh, specific argument last. Now we'll come back to the common forms of argument discussed, uh, the, co the most common forms of argument in the next lecture. Uh, the five I'm going to focus on in that lecture are uh, the idea that the article or chapter addresses a lacuna, which is say a, a specific area where we previously have lacked knowledge, uh, or number two, that the article or chapter will solve a problem, something that has uh, vexed historians or social scientists in the past, or you might uh, make a straw man argument in which you you pull up some uh, pre some existing article or book in which you know the author has it wrong and you set about to explain why they have it wrong or you resolve a debate between academics or you make the case for comparison with other data sets and in a way that can be the most complex. Now ideally you avoid inserting uh, an X curse into any section uh, if it is unavoidable, if you feel that you must have a kind of digression uh, inserted into the article somewhere to fill the reader in on something you, you feel is absolutely necessary, then ideally you're going to put it in that first foundational section within the body. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're going to get pulled up on this and a reviewer or PhD examiner is going to say, you know, no, move this back to an earlier point. Uh, the last thing that people like to see in the Anglo-American academic tradition is an X curse in a late stage of an argument because it, it inter, as we say in English, it interrupts the flow of the argument. So you want to focus on uh, the incremental marshalling of data uh, and arguments. So again, this is about starting with that ground floor, most broad uh, body of data, and then analyzing subsets of the data. And by data, I mean not only kind of economic or mathematical material, but indeed data as in specific uh, statements you found within uh, primary source material, even though that's literature. And you want to move towards uh, move towards a final argument in the last part of your uh, chapter or article, which could only be made if the reader understood everything that came before, and therefore now they can understand the significance of these final narrow points of data you're working with. Again, this is, is referred to as logical progression uh, within the chapter or article. And it's, it's normally uh, an assessed element in a PhD or in a reviewed article. Note here that this is maybe one of two points where we have the greatest contrast with the German style. You'll probably recall me talking about the German articles with uh, various excurses as, as a kind of spiral where you filled in with an awful lot of uh, what seems at first extraneous detail that's then revealed to be important only in the conclusion. This is a slide from the first lecture. You should re, uh, recognize it here. And uh, again, I, I quite like this image of the set of Russian dolls that you have in the bottom right, because effectively those are your sections within your article. You know, the, the big one, the broad one comes first. And, and at the very kind of heart or core of what you have to say, the final element in the series of points you make will be that uh, a little Russian doll. Uh, that can only set inside the other arguments. I remind you here that in the Anglo-American tradition, particularly in the, the British academic tradition, the, the uh, 
identity of the article or chapter's uh, author is not important. So, you know, try to avoid saying, I will show you that. It is my opinion that, you know, I will argue that, you know, speak in the third person in general terms. Uh, that's to say, use a low degree of self-reference. You are listing evidence. Uh, the evidence makes the article work, not the author. There should be little or no digression. Uh, use bridging terms. That's to say, indicate at the end of one paragraph or at the end of one section how the next section will relate to it. Paragraphs, again, have a topic sentence and at least two supporting sentences. Uh, try to avoid long paragraphs that include more than one topic. Uh, take a high degree of responsibility for the readers. That's to say, define your terms as you go. And this, in a way, uh, suits nicely the uh, ladder analogy here. At the, on the first rung of the ladder, you deal with the, in the first section of your chapter or article, you deal with the broad material, but you also define the terms, the specialty vocabulary, so that you can use that vocabulary without hesitation in section two or section three or section four. When it comes to the conclusion, in the Anglo-American tradition, this should be relatively short. I would stress most academic journals, because they're under pressure from, uh, to publish more and more material in English, as the global academic community shifts to using English, it means that journals have tended to uh, shorten articles that they accept. Uh, typically, word counts are used, and where 20 or 30 years ago, a 15 or 20,000 word article would not have been unusual in the social sciences. Now, a six to 8,000 word article is standard. 10,000 is a little bit on the long side, uh, and it's very rare that you find a journal in the social sciences that will accept more than 10 to 12,000 words. Now, what this means is, uh, you need to be really sharp and punchy with your article. The arguments need to make themselves in the sections uh, that comprise this argument middle body of the uh, chapter or journal article. And the conclusion should be relatively short, one page or less. It would be rare for a thesis chapter or an article conclusion to exceed one page of finished text. Now, again, this is in contrast with German style, in which a, a complex conclusion or prestige can be quite long and, and work very hard and visibly to draw together the various excursies of the German spiral. Not so in your uh, Anglo-American tradition. The uh, conclusion is rarely more than one page. Main elements that uh, a examiner or reviewer will expect to see in your conclusion, and they should appear in this order. You restate the proposition or thesis statement. Number two, you summarize the evidence presented uh, in the order in which you presented it. So again, getting that hierarchy from general to specific uh, when you're composing the middle part of the chapter or journal article is really important because otherwise it's going to look a little strange when you summarize in just a sentence or two uh, each section. If, uh, if the last one isn't the most important, then it's going to look strange. Finally, point to the wider implications. Further the further directions of research. Where does this take us next? And this really is your opportunity for self-expression and the degree of speculation. You know, where do we go from here? What, what research should be done next? How does this article uh, impact or shape the rest of what we know about related topics in this field of study? That said, never introduce new evidence or new arguments in the conclusion. There's a big difference between saying, Okay, I've, you know, we've proven this, this is where we should go next, on the one hand, and 
introducing new speculative argument, new arguments on the other hand. You can speculate about the significance to the wider field of the research you've just presented. You cannot speculate about other arguments that could be made with the same data. Can you see the difference there? It's a fine balance between, on the one hand, being too modest and, and not ex expressing the significance of your research, and on the other hand, being too arrogant. It needs to be self-evident that, that uh, you are the expert and this matters. Uh, but you also can't overplay your hand, as we say. And uh, I think PhD students in particular are sometimes uh, prone to fall on one side or the other of, of this sort of balance and to make a mistake in one direction or the other. I think usually, certainly in the British context, PhD students tend to be, if anything, too modest. Uh, I can remember after my PhD, I, I started a postdoctoral fellowship at Oxford and I uh, was invited in to meet uh, the uh, uh, Church Professor of Medieval History at All Souls College, Oxford, the kind of head of medieval history at Oxford, uh, which is a routine affair where he would meet each of the new arriving postdoctoral students or postdoctoral academics. And uh, he asked me uh, some pertinent questions about my PhD. And of course, I said, uh, well, I think it's a bit like this. In my opinion, it's, it's probably a bit like this. And, and I framed my conclusions in that very hedged manner. And he said, well, either you know or you don't know, because let's face it, you've just written a PhD on this. No one knows more about it than you. Now think carefully and tell me what your conclusions were directly. And that's, that taught me a good lesson. And it's a lesson I uh, hope I can pass on to you here. You know, be direct about your conclusions. They do matter. On the other hand, don't go crazy with it and, and say you've changed the universe. So I finish here by uh, mentioning some uh, optional readings and uh, discussion. Uh, really, this lecture should be followed by uh, a kind of group discussion of your experiences of reading uh, literature, particularly Anglophone literature, but maybe that's a discussion that you can have, uh, you know, via a video chat with other students you know, or uh, via email. Uh, I give you one reading here that you might choose to look at, which is uh, uh, Victoria Ray's uh, Demystifying the Journal article in the uh, online journal Inside Higher Education 2017. Much of what she has to say will, will echo what I've put in this lecture, uh, but she says it in much less detail. In terms of discussion, you might uh, look at some articles in respected English language journals in your area of study. And I would, again, emphasize that the most important part of this, this, uh, this series of uh, Verstati or workshops is that after each lecture, lecture you reflect on literature in your own area of study. You can see how uh, they conform to or differ from this generic ideal of the form of an Anglophone article I've set out here. And uh, they will differ depending on author's styles. Uh, even I don't follow slavishly to this generic pattern. Uh, I give you a couple of examples here from an open access uh, volume that, that came out with uh, Breppels in 2018. There's, uh, I will, as we say in English, put my money where my mouth is and uh, uh, offer you an example of something I've written, which more or less follows this generic pattern. But also you might compare it with a, a fine article to be found there by Richard Goddard uh, on uh, finance and women and credit in medieval England, which again, more or less follows this generic pattern, but deviates in, in certain specific ways. Now in the next, next lecture, which I uh, estimate you will find more interesting than this one. I will talk about different ways in which the, the argument central part of chapters or journal articles are constructed because there are certain stylistic uh, uh, fashions 
in how you construct arguments that you see repeated again and again, and you really ought to know them. So that's all for now. I hope you found this uh, useful. I suspect that you might not find it useful now, but later on in your PhD, if you come back to this, having read more, uh, particularly more English language literature or tried to prepare a journal article, uh, as students do from their thesis at a late stage, that you come back to this and it may well be more useful to you then. Thank you.